We've got an emergency. Windows has just released an update. Somehow, Windows Defender is now blocking my Windows utility script. Some This latest update to the definitions, we're gonna run it. I haven't updated, I don't think, this system yet. So we'll run it beforehand. We're gonna isolate it down to the exact update that's causing this. And then we're gonna see if there's some way around it or if Microsoft's just blanket blocking every single script that comes on PowerShell. So pretty important, kind of an emergency to get this done. Um, not exactly the stream I was going for today, but such is life. Uh, yeah, Blah. not what I wanted to do today, but yeah, that's just how it goes when you have a Microsoft product or anything that runs on Windows. That's the, the nature of the beast. Microsoft can alter the deal. They're like Darth Vader. You know, they've altered the deal. Pray they don't alter it anymore. <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> I had the channel open in the background and you jump scared me. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, wild, man. It's going to be a wild one today for this stream because holy crap, I did not anticipate this. Let's play a game. Let's get it going. First off, does it launch in this? should launch because I haven't updated. All right. Yeah. Shh, no problem there. I don't know if I've launched this much. Um, so here is this on this machine. Now, obviously the first launch was fine, but if we run our updates, I bet you there'll be like a Defender Edition update. And God bless, it's gonna cause all kinds of havoc. Because I, if you're unaware, Windows Utility I track, there's a little link that christtitus.com forward slash win. That's actually just a link to the raw GitHub file. That's all it does. But I can see how many people are using it because the link gets used. Now, obviously people could still reference the raw GitHub file and not the link, but every time that link gets hit, I get a count. So I got a good basis and roughly the script has gotten so popular, we're up to, I think uh, it depends on the day, but most days around 10,000 hits a day. So over 10,000 users are using this script every single day. That's kind of nuts. And this new update is gonna, it's only gonna get worse as people actually do it. So let's run the update, see if we can't reproduce it because I've been getting reports all morning long that they updated the PC and they're just starting to trickle in. Hey, I can't run the script. I'm trying to run things, nothing's happening. False flag operation in progress. Microsoft, they're out to get me. There it is. Security intelligence update, Microsoft Defender. Current channel broad. KB2267602. Oh, I have a feeling. I have a feeling this update. Oh no. We got two updates. One's to the anti-malware platform, KB5007651. That also looks like it might. All right, I'm pounding my second Celsius today. It's about to get real. Yeah, let's do it. <clears throat> Here we go. All right, well, so we saw it worked. Now we did the update. Might need a reboot, but okay. It, it still launched. Nice. That's what I want to see. So this is done, but as with anything in Windows, you got to reboot to see the effects. Let's restart it. Ah. <sighs> Yeah, it got so popular that Microsoft, the man, came after me. <laughs> probably not. Probably not. They probably just were like, hey, uh, I, I, if anything, probably some malware teams probably saw how I was distributing the script and go, you know what? That would probably be a good delivery platform for a virus. And honestly, you wouldn't be wrong. I mean, doing an elevated run as admin uh, through a PowerShell script, it's a good way to exploit Windows because I do change a lot in the system. And if I was a malware provider, doing it that method would would be relatively easy to bypass all antivirus, no matter what you're using. So it, it it is a loophole in security. So I don't fault Microsoft if they do end up blocking my script, but it does mean that I'm going to have to figure out a way to continue to do this man all right 
but we still haven't seen it deny. So let's launch our script again. We're just going to come right back in and uh, it looks like it's going to do it. I might have disabled Defender, although it is taking a while. Oh, oh, no, sir. Code signing, Harold. Code signing doesn't do shit for this. Good luck. How do you code sign a PowerShell script? I'm just using official Microsoft commands. I'm not loading any external libraries or anything. Shit. This is a big problem. <sighs> yeah, just disable Defender. Can't tell people that, though. I cannot tell people that. It's true. Your antivirus, honestly, no matter what antivirus you use, they're pretty pointless. If I was actually a malware writer, I could bypass them pretty easily. They don't do anything except make end users feel comfortable. Great for marketing. Great for affiliate sales, too. If you're an influencer and you want to sell some antivirus, you get a good 30 to 50% rip off all sales. So sell those giant internet suites for 50, 60 bucks, make 20 or $30 a sale. Not a bad gig. Not a bad gig. But I'm not in that business. I'm in the free and open source software business. And now I feel the pain, the pain of the curl dev. This is what happened to him. Uh, Defender decided to fly off the handle and, and flag curl.exe as malicious. The I think it was a couple months ago when that happened. Bro. Oh, God bless Windows, man. Oh, <sighs> <laughs> I don't even know what to say. <laughs> the worst keeps getting worse. <laughs> All right, how do we get around this? Let's first try. Maybe they they purposely hard coded it in. Let's let's just say, hey, maybe they don't like me. That let's hope for that. Because then, if they don't like me, we can just obfuscate the the link into something different. That'd be relatively easy to do. So let's let's first try that. Um, we're gonna go when you till PS1 raw file. Let's grab that, copy it, and try and run uh, IRM. And we're just gonna do an IEX. All right, script contains malicious content is blocked by your antivirus. <sighs> All right. Um, yeah, Phoenix, we we have over 10,000 users per day on this script. Glaze WM is going to have to wait. This is by far my most pressing issue. I have a ton of people hitting me up, blowing me up on email, blowing me up on the interwebs, everything. So this has to be fixed. So obviously, can't do that. Shit. All right, let's try... Uh, Maybe they just targeted the raw GitHub file. Let's try to switch to the test branch, run it. Or are they blanket banning all IEX from IRMs? We could try to do a invoke web request, switch it to an IWR. And I think that would also fix our issue. Oh, dude. Ah, come on. Give me, give me the address. We'll do an IRM. Let's switch over to the test branch. Those dirty sons of bitches. They flagged my URL. You kidding me? No way. What the fuck? Ah. Uh, no way. They hard coded the URL into Defender? No. No. That can't be right. All right, let's do a main branch merge of the test branch. Maybe there's some specific code in the main branch that they didn't like. Let's try that. Let's try that. I, I refuse to believe that's what happened here. That doesn't... I There has to be some kind of code they're targeting. They can't just... I mean, they can, but they're not going to just type my URL in and just say it's malware. That's... I'm not that important. No. All right. Um, let's see. We've got to do a main branch merge. I've already merged all the PRs for this. So uh, we have some micro win fixes. 
we fixed tight VNC install issue. Uh, we have various Winget issue uh, fixes. Winget fixes. Uh, this top one for MicroWin, I think that was Coding Wonders. Coding Wonders. Uh, tight VNC ish is Husky. Let's give some proper uh, Husky Devil. Gotta gotta give a shout out to all our con contributors. Um, and let's see here. I want to say there was some Winged fix here. Where was that? Ah, the Rux underscore. I wanted to. He he had a lot of really good Winged fixes for Rux underscore. Or I think yeah, Rux underscore. Perfect. What else did we have? I think there is. Yeah, I think that's pretty good. We're not gonna go too crazy. It's a pretty small PR into the main branch. Normally I'd wait a month, but obviously. With today's thing let's change the main one obviously the script is fine for running off of the test branch i'm now like hey is it the url that's getting flagged let's let's go ahead and see if the url itself is in defender and they're they're flagging it if that's the case we can always change the name create a new url and then it's just a matter of time before they update that url but they'll have to update it we can we can easily move. It, it's not that big a deal. All right, main branch. We're gonna squash and merge this. All right, our main branch is getting merged in not right now. What is the PR we have? Add a few apps. Yeah, we're actually gonna. I'm not gonna merge that. Yeah, let's look at the issues. How issues might be blown up. Yeah, here we go. This is the main one we're, we're doing. IWR is also getting flagged and IRM. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Let's see what anybody else is finding. Yeah, looks like Defender's literally just targeting the script. That's wild, guys. Totally wild. <laughs> wow, wow, the script prevents us from gathering telemetry from thousands of users. Time to block it. It's a virus. That's what we're going to label it. Oh, gosh. Yeah. All right. Time for a reboot. Um, let's see. Let's see. Uh, right now, I am troubleshooting the script to see what exactly is getting flagged. So far, it looks as if Microsoft targeted the URL and none of the code in the script. Let's actually let's let's just finish running this in the merge because we just merged. Let's test to make sure that that's the case. If that's the case, it means Microsoft has gone out of its way and said anything come from the URL could be. I mean, honestly, they could have just talked to their GitHub team and just killed the project from that because it is Microsoft that runs GitHub. Oh man, that sucks. Okay, so here's here's our deal. Um, this should be 328. 328. So we're going to go raw. This is a brand new script. We just ran it from the test branch, which was a U new URL. So the only thing that has changed here is we've 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 merged it in the main branch, and I'm seeing if they're flagging the URL. The test one went right through. So now if we come over here and we go IRM, we paste this in, we're just going to do an IEX behind my head. IEX. <laughs> so that worked. So there's something in the code. Okay, it's not the URL. What did I change in the code that would have flagged the antivirus? Let's do an IRM of Chris Titus. Now, sometimes that doesn't. Okay, that worked too. Okay, so did they, what was the problem with the code? Yeah, so, okay. So they did not flag the URL. There was something specifically about the last commit that Windows Defender did not like. As soon as I merged the test branch into the main, main branch, it looks like everything has gone away. Now, if anybody else was getting flagged with WinUtil, let me know. 
I'm checking out chat. It had to be some variables or something. I did, I have been trying to clean up and minimize when you till in recent, uh, recent goes. And what I've done is I, I've gotten rid of about a couple thousand lines of code that I thought was pretty redundant and also offloaded stuff to the other, uh, compile script. So the user won't be rendering dynamic elements. So it should run faster is basically what I'm saying. Okay. So that sub seems to work now. Works for now. Okay, it works for me now. Okay, good. Looks okay. It works now. Weird. Probably the... Okay, so they probably put the hash of the script in the virus list. So probably just wait for an update. Let's see. What's the about look like? Okay, we have the new version. So they, they just got like the MD5 hash of the like the PS1 file. So as soon as the PS1 file changes, obviously we get a different hash. That'd be a weird way of submitting it, but... Doesn't Defender just like work off like hysteretics or whatever that that word is, but it just maybe someone maybe multiple people flagged it? Okay, it blocked a 86 box too. Huh. That's bonkers, guys. Well, let's just uh reply back to this and say be fixed now. I can confirm. So what do we know? I can confirm the latest windows defender updates flagged when util.ps1 as a virus however no major code was changed and i merged some basic fixes in from the test branch and now it launches fine the best i can come up with is they block listed or I should they flagged the hash of the old PS1 script. I do worry that they will update this and flag it again in the future. Huh. You're having an issue with uh, SSL? Yeah, I don't think Microsoft likes my utility, for sure. It strips out a lot of telemetry. It also strips out a lot of their built-in processes. Specifically, a lot of the user and system processes get set to manual, so there's quite a bit of less processes running on, on boot. So those two fixes really change things around. Also, it deprioritizes the Microsoft Store and elevates Winget to be much more functional. So, you know, I, I honestly don't think anybody should use the Microsoft Store if you can get away with it. Yeah, some installs, we just did a merge from the test branch, uh, Yusuf. So if you look on there, Yusuf, uh, check out and see if that also uh, denies it now. We, we did some conditional statements. So more, more software should be able to install relatively easily. I think there's some software we need to remove Specifically, I think someone was saying like NeoFetch, Windows NeoFetch, and some other ones was a scoop package, not a chocolatey package, and that wasn't getting installed properly, but I don't see that. Let's see what other issues are here. But I think that 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 looks like for now it fixed the problem, but I think it's going to come back because there's no reason for the other one to get... It just doesn't make any sense to me. <clears throat> this one's saying uh, NeoFetch doesn't work. Let's try NeoFetch. NeoFetch. Let's install it. Do we have any problems with NeoFetch? Okay. Yeah. That The test branch merge also looks like it fixed that issue. So if we close out of this, let's run NeoFetch. Yeah, Rux. I, Rux put a lot of the win, win, uh, Winget logic in that fixed some of the errors we got when we were doing Winget install. I think adding the scope machine messes things up. And there's also some packages in Winget that you have to use from a user level. So since this script gets run as admin, things like Spotify don't like to install through Winget because it requires you to be in an unelevated prompt, meaning as a user prompt. 
So you don't want it as like scope machine. You'd want it as like scope user. All right, gaming said there's an issue with PowerShell 7 import data file. I th that's interesting. I wonder what that's about. Yeah, custom ISOs get kind of funky. That's the one problem I have with the, uh, let's see. Can, can we just run Neil fetch? Yeah, yeah, there we go. Yeah, okay, that works. That looks to, looks to be fixed. Uh, what was the last commit? Let's reference some of that. Uh, 1748. Man, I can't believe we've done, <laughs> we've done so many commits and issues. <laughs> it's kind of insane, man. I can't believe how big this project has gotten. All right. Uh, fixed now with 1748. My favorite defender story was when they blocked curl. <laughs> they blocked curl.exe as a malicious virus. Okay, so here's here's this one. Uh, Rux actually submitted it to me, and Gaming Evolution mentioned it in chat as well. There's a bug right now testing the script using PowerShell 5.1 and decided to test PowerShell 7, and I got this result. So using PowerShell 7 on Windows 10 leads to this error. Appears for GF, uh, GPU info. Get WMI object. Okay. After a little research, I may suggest using git sim instance as a fallback from that will return similar information. Okay. Got a fix there as well. Yeah, it should be solved too. If you have an issue with Winget, um, actually Rux, I think, put the 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 big commit in this last patch that we just patched like literally five minutes ago. And uh, Rux coded the Winget install to grab the dependencies. Now by defaults with 23H2 in Windows, Win gets broken. So even though Win gets an official Microsoft product, apparently the people at Microsoft don't know how to install it properly because 23H2 is, it just breaks Win to get by default. So hopefully this this one, um, let's, let's build a micro Win ISO and do a test install here. I'm kind of curious to see what this does on a fresh install. Also, I wanna test this to make sure it's not saying it's malicious, just to double check things, because I'm still iffy that it's the hash that they were going after in PS1 and they put that in the latest update. Because one, that's gonna get really annoying if someone's constantly tracking my file and, and putting it into a uh, Windows Defender. But if they are, then I guess I just, I guess I just have to merge every test to, to main every like four days or five days or however often they're going to update definitions. It's just kind of insane. Sorry for the language earlier. I was just kind of over the kind of, kind of mad. <laughs> it's getting flagged because you're removing edge store apps and possible micro win. Yeah, I think so. I, I think that's the big thing why Microsoft really doesn't want you to remove Edge. Like if you look, I haven't done a, a big removal of the Microsoft Store or Edge because one, a lot of times I do need things from the Microsoft Store to test. And you'll notice every single time, Microsoft Edge is always running on every single Windows instance. Now, I'm kind of wanting to install the Windows Pro inversion because they got sued in the EU. EU versions about a month or two ago, they get to remove Edge. Now, I would love to make a video seeing if that they, they removed it properly because Edge, the, the funny thing about all this is Edge, if they didn't remove it, and let's say it's still like pieced into the operating system, they can get resued from the EU. After this, them false flagging my toolbox, I kind of want to make a video installing the European version of Edge, the new version, and say, hey, Microsoft said they installed or removed Edge from Windows, but they lied. I mean, that's just a great Windows title because I almost guarantee you they said you can remove Edge now, but they don't actually remove Edge. I, I think EU, I think, you know, that would be cool. And I bet somebody would see that and bring it up to their lawmakers and they lose another billion dollars. 
I would love that. That would be sweet revenge. I'm not I'm not spiteful at all. <laughs> I'd be like, I'll show you guys. Cost you another billion dollars for flagging my utility. <laughs> oh man. Uh, with VPNs. I need to do a VPN. Uh a VPN video. A lot of people don't realize I'm kind of I'm kind of standoffish about talking about antivirus or VPNs though. I did get um I can't really talk about it because they they threatened to sue me, but I did get a demand letter from a big conglomerate uh specifically when I made the video about my antivirus, antivirus tier list. And that's uh, a bit concerning. And if I make a VPN video, I'm afraid something like that will happen again. And that's uh, also concerning because VPNs, a lot of people think of them as security and privacy, but really three companies own everything, all the VPNs. Every VPN you know is typically controlled by two or three entities. Uh, you know, it's kind of wild. Like, look at PIA, uh, I think it's VPN Ghost or whatever the hell that is. And there's a huge, huge bunch of them. I think I made it a little... I think I bookmarked an article, but it's even worse than the article made it out to be. So if you're thinking of VPNs, yeah, I've seen, I've actually seen that article. Shocking. Um, but yeah, Cape Technology, they have CyberGhost, ZenMate, Private Internet Access, and also ExpressVPN. It's all Cape. So all four of these VPNs uh, are getting consolidated into one entity. So if you have any of these, guess what? They're probably all using the same infrastructure. And if they do want to spy on anybody using them, well, they can. That's kind of wild. And then you have IP Vanish and Strong VPN. Then you have Nord, which is Nord, Atlas, and Surfshark. Those are all the same. A lot of people don't realize that these big conglomerates are gobbling up all these things. And really only two or three people own all those VPNs. Um, that's, that's kind of wild. And, and a lot of the marketing behind VPNs is specifically on security. But again, it's a scary video to make because these companies are very powerful and I'd be worried I'd get sued just, just by making the video. Um, but yeah, it, it's kind of wild. Yeah. Nord had a security breach uh, a couple years back. I think actually the best person on YouTube that actually talked about that security breach on Nord was Jay's two cents. Jay's two cents specifically came out and said that they, uh, uh kind of, kind of overlaying it, but the gist of it was hackers got control, uh, of, uh, an out of band server, which basically means they had root level access to that server for a prolonged period of time. I think it was over 30 days and they could do whatever they wanted to it. And there's one data center. Um, it, they have various data centers around the world, but I think it was only one that was compromised at that level, which is a pretty big compromise. And it was an extended period of time. Having said that a lot of government entities and hacking groups have gotten in and they, uh, it's kind of weird. It's like a whole different cyber weapons race going on in the background. And, and a lot of them have compromised, like between it all, a lot of people think I'm secure or, uh, that, but really a lot of times uh, it's almost like, a it's almost like a nuclear arsenal. You know how there's deterrence saying, Hey, I'll take down your electrical grid or that type of thing. That is kind of what's going on. It, I think a lot of these major co countries are capable of actually inflicting massive damage from a cyber attack, but a lot of people, a lot of them won't do it because then they also get retaliated against from the cyber attack. So very much the same, very much the same type of thing. Ah, going for the second month of Linux after many years. Hell yeah, Pan. I love hearing that. I love hearing people trying Linux out, man. Linux is still king. I 100% agree with you, man. I'm, I'm, I love me some Linux. <laughs> Can you change your region in Windows 10 and to any region and uninstall? Oh, that's an interesting way to uninstall Edge. Let's try that. Let's uh, let's try to uninstall Edge. Let's just go region. Uh, let's change our uh, region. Uh, actually, you know what? Probably the best way to change your region 
is not using the region tab uh that's actually a windows 7 region uh, the newer way is probably the best so let's go region here go region settings this is a little bit different so we have english united states let's uh let's convert this to over the you know across the pond oh it's not allowing me look at that look at that microsoft locking me in well i mean let's see all right here we go country or region let's switch to united kingdom all right go get some fish and chips and get rid of edge all right let's try i think just that might work but let's see english i don't think we're gonna need yeah let's let's just keep that as recommended actually english united states is kind of what i want to use i don't think let's just try that and language packs i i think we can get away with this just change the country or region here i think will be enough all right let's give it a whirl oh uk is not the eu oh that's right i forgot about brexit i'm sorry guys <laughs> oh poor eu or actually probably poor poor uk <laughs> you guys got dunked on all right uh got taken advantage of oh where do we go uh select ireland yeah ireland's the way to go ireland's still in the uk and they still speak english as main language so ireland top of the morning to you let's do it that should be good enough <laughs> we're still suffering yeah i knew it was bad whenever the brexit thing happened and because i, I do love the united kingdom and you know a lot of things you know my wife's really into like doctor who and that type of thing and when all that happened, I was like, you know, babe, this would be a perfect time to go to the UK because Brexit happened and the pound used to be like two to one. You know, it was like two US dollars equals one pound. And for a little bit there, we had almost complete parity. I don't know what it is now, but one pound was like one US dollar. And I was like, wow, that's insane. Like people's entire savings just like melted away overnight in the united kingdom but as an american i was like dude let's go visit the united kingdom now our money is worth way more now but yeah the uk got completely screwed in that deal from from what i know all right we switched our region to ireland now that we're irish let's see if we can uninstall some microsoft edge we're just gonna grab the old app with cpl and you're just going to right click change and uh, we don't have any uh, uninstall here change yeah can only got the repair and cancel hmm ah okay you also need a new username get out of here one dollars 79 cents pound okay yeah yeah that, that, that makes sense that makes sense so it, it did rebound a little bit but for a little while there it was very very close to one to one so we've restarted and we're on Ireland. We still don't can't uninstall. Now I know Phoenix has been hounding me for Glaze WM. Let's take a sidetrack so Phoenix doesn't have to spam chat anymore about Glaze WM. Let's try the Windows Manager Glaze WM. Just for you, Phoenix. I know for the last week or two, maybe longer, you've been talking about Glaze WM. Let's just try it out. It has over 3,000 stars. Let's grab the latest release. Um, I wonder, is it in Winget? Let's try it in, in Winget. Glaze. We're going to glaze it up. Glaze. What do we have for Glaze WM? Show me an installer. Hot damn. All right. Bam. Glaze WM. Look at the instructions first. When have I ever done that? <laughs> but yes, let's let's actually look at the instructions. Okay. It's a SAML uh YAML. I, I'm not gonna judge anything, but YAML configurations an immediate strike, guys. Only masochists use YAML. 
the stupid spacing and the tab. I'm sorry, I'm just not a fan of YAML. I, I don't know why it exists. I'm just like, ah, you know, it is simple, but YAML, you gotta be careful. Anytime you're editing YAML, you gotta watch your spacing because one space off and then it can just throw everything, throw everything in, in a very, very bad spot. I'm not gonna judge anything, proceeds to judge YAML. Yeah, that's true, I'm sorry, yeah. I lied. YAML sucks, let's just, let's just say it. All right, multi-monitor support, customizer bar window. Oh, that's kind of cool, I like the little bar window they got going. What do they do with the bottom, I wonder? Easy one-click install. Okay, download. I ended up just Winget in it. Uh, Winget installs portable packages into local Microsoft Winget packages by default. This can be overridden by the location flag. Interesting. Okay. Configuration. So we need a config. The default configuration can be generated. So here's our default configuration. Uh, if we launch it, what happens? Okay. Key bindings. Alt one, Alt shift one. I kind of like that. That's not going to conflict with my current window manager as I use mod key one for all that. So that, that works. So I could do window manager here with the alt focus just by doing that. I like it. Alt shift focus window border configuration, gap configuration. Inner gap, 20 pixels. Whoa, this guy must use like a 4K monitor. 20 pixel gaps are insanity. You stole a config with a computer. Link it in chat, Phoenix. All right. Bar configuration, bar enabled true. So if we just do a glazed WM directly off the CMD, I wonder what it'll do. Well documented though, I will say. That's impressive. Okay. So we got that. We've got our download configuration. You got the key bindings, workspaces, bar config. I like a lot of the default bindings. I think we need to add a couple things, but like launching the browser and that type of thing. Um, shrink window. I wonder why they did the Vim bindings with focus. It's kind of an odd, odd, odd choice. Uh, enter is uh, alt enter is launch terminal. That's very basic kill window when alt shift is pressed honestly i kind of like just alt q i probably would actually move this up here yeah this is this is gonna be a little weird but i yeah i kind of like it because a lot of these key bindings aren't going to conflict with my current one because a lot of people don't realize that i am using linux on top of my windows so then I could use the Linux manager, which still registers all my Linux bindings, but then I could register new bindings on this window manager, and then it would control everything here. So then I could launch everything with a, a different hot hotkey. I like it. Now, as far as specifying different program launchers in here, that's one thing we do probably need to look at. So let's just launch it once and see what happens so we'll go glaze all right let's uh close out of this let's just go glaze WM. glaze oh huh. okay didn't rec recognize that um let's just launch a non-elevated terminal glaze okay okay subscribe dot glaze wm yes <laughs> yeah. uh, let's try and break it. If I put, okay, and then like close. Ah, that's cool. And then workspace two. Color me impressed. All right, let's take this one. We're gonna go Alt Shift two. Oh, and them some big gaps, but I kind of dig it. Don't have any air sitting in here. Nice. Glaze WM. Hell yeah. Pretty neat. Hide the taskbar. Yeah, so we could just go taskbar settings. Let's go. This works a lot better than Cormambi. It already, I already like it a lot better. Ooh. Oh. 
I I gotta say, that's nice. That's that's really nice. Okay, let's do a run command. What does that look like? Oops. So let's go run. Okay. So it does grab the floating. Interesting. I handled it pretty well. <laughs> the gap is huge. <laughs> yeah, I think a gap. I mean, call me old fashioned, but I like my gaps non-existent. Like, just just give me all of the screen. You know, that's kind of how I like my gaps. Like these huge giant giant ones. I'm kind of like that's for those. That's for the weebs. <laughs> that's for that's for the weebs for Linux risers. I'm a zero px kind of guy. <laughs> one pixel gaps. Okay, let's try uh, the one pixel gaps. <laughs> no events, weebs. <laughs> uh, all right. Oh, okay. Got to get used to the. That's cool. All right. So then let's go config. Uh, glaze. Nice. All right. So we got our gaps. Let's just take uh, the 20. How do you think the live reload works? Is there a live reload? Oh, no, there isn't. So you'd have to take this, cancel, and then relaunch. Oh, no. Interesting. Did not actually kill it. Oh, there's a binding for it in alt. Okay. What's the binding? Binding. Where are you at? Binding. All right. Here we go. Default bindings. The live reload will be alt. Not there. Alt shift R. Alt shift Ah, much better. I'm not a big fan of the rounded windows. That's a choice. I probably also, you know how it kind of offsets that. One thing I like to do, just kill. Kill the desktop icons. Give me the give me the cleanness of it all. I like that. Yeah. Zero rounding, I think, is what we're gonna do. So we have that. Let's uh pull up our vim. Oh shoot, I don't have my vim loaded. Ugh. Default Vim. Gross. Anywho. Glaze. Let's Vim our config YAML. Around. Uh, Where's our rounding? Um, I wonder what that is. We got the bar. General. Floating. Windows animations unchanged. We strongly recommend to set this to false. Whether global or enable set to unchanged to make no settings change. whatever is there an animation yeah I don't I don't think I have an animation right no I don't think there's much of an animation there corners okay corner I can't find corner all right adding component clock okay workspaces windows rules it should be under windows rules Task manager requires administration. Okay. Oh, it's in Windows settings, like effects. Windows 11 has rounded corners. Rounded corners is on non-maximized windows, where the maximized windows has. So we go back to one here. We go maximized. Oh, weird. This one's not maximized. See? Maximized, not maximized. This one. Oh, now it has round corners. How odd. Border radius is what most people are saying. I like it though. I do like it. So we have a bunch of different ones right here. Toggle floating. Change, change the focus window to be maximized, unmaximized, alt X. I like that. Honestly, I like this just alt Q and that's fine. Execute CMD. Not too much going on here. Um, I do wonder if I can't program in some specific launches and in windows into the, the window manager. Um, let's look for border real fast. Border radius. Borders, focus borders. Border radius zero. Okay. Is there any other border? Okay. Some applications have borders that extend past normal border size. Resize those borders. Yeah, I think it's just a window setting. 
Okay, border is not officially by sort of forward or by windows. Okay. Very interesting. Cool. <laughs> ah, excuse me. Yeah, I think it's just a Windows aesthetic. I mean, it's not... The, I don't really care that much. All right, what else do we have? Um, let's launch this. I kind of like... I, I love the, the layout here. Um, how do we want to launch Glaze WM on Startup? What's your guys' favorite way? Now, you could do the tried and true, where you're just like, okay, run. And then you got Shell Startup. We could toss a shortcut into Shell Common Startup. Or, or shell startup. That's a pretty easy way to do it. You could do GPO. This is a, a pro instance. Task scheduler. Well, that's a different way. I, I'm not a huge task scheduler guy. I really don't like task scheduler. Task scheduler is great for exploiting windows because it's really easy to elevate certain tasks to admin prompts. So let's say you ever wanted to hack someone in a window. Task scheduler is really where you should start because it's probably the, the weakest chink in the armor of windows then again you're talking to the guy that created a script powershell script <laughs> honestly if you, you launch powershell with admin uh, you can do pretty much anything as well so there's that let's do none of those i didn't see anybody in chat go the gpo route so let's let's do it the other way uh let's go gpedit.msc and oh that's weird kind of gave me a gap so what we can do is user config. I think it's under software settings or maybe it's Windows settings. Yeah, scripts, log on, log off. Just toss a little script in here. That would also be fine. You could also do a reg add. <laughs> There's so many different ways. Or you could do like an auto run if you want to you do it that way too. It's kind of insane how many different ways you can start a program in Windows. So you, you have that way, that this method um we could do control alt escape i think it is uh control shift escape sorry uh and from your task manager you can actually come down here and that's services did they get rid of it i believe they have changed up the task manager by a good bit by a good margin startup apps here we go so you can actually can we add anything in here Disable edge. <laughs> uh, what else do we have? You got phone link that's disabled. Sys health tray, we can disable that. And disable the. Yeah. Oh, that looks good. Cool. Yeah, I think honestly, the best way for. I think just doing a shell startup like that. Uh, actually, sorry, you can't do it that way. We got to do it from the run command. So if we do a shell startup here, and then we gotta find glaze. Ah, uh, you can't do it. Let's do a vim glaze wm. We'll just do glaze.bat. And then I think you can just do a run, right? Like, let's just go glaze. Is it glaze wm.exe? Yeah, glaze wm.exe. I mean, this is probably the, the most simple way. So like if you cat glaze, it's just going to be that. So then if we go explore here, I'm sorry, explore, explorer here with a dot, you can just take the glaze bat file bloop, and then on startup glaze should start. So to test this theory, let's, uh, I think we can kill it with a control alt Q, control Q. Close all. Okay. So then it, it's it's killed. So to test this theory for Glaze or the, the startup, let's just go shell startup. And then we're just going to go double click. Uh, it, does, it does run the command on the background though. So we could, we'd probably need to hide that. Yeah, we could just add the Glaze WMEXE in the bat file. I think that's really what we need to do. So what we'll do, we can just right click. Another thing, Windows 11. If anybody from Microsoft watches this, what are you doing with this context menu? Drugs are bad. You guys should start testing your employees because 
Whoever designed this, that right there, that is a that person is on drugs if they think that is an improvement over this. Like anybody that isn't high on crack <laughs> can tell this is a better user experience. Why? Why is this the default? I guess maybe the aesthetic? I don't know. I don't know, guys. Anyway, just just a small rant. Let's try uh, the at symbol. All right, so then we launch it. Nah, still doesn't hide it. Uh, and I think if we do an echo off, I don't think that works as well. In my startup manager, everything is just dash startup. And it starts in the background. Yeah, you can do the show me more options. I think we actually, didn't we code that into the script? Call me crazy, but I think we did. Let's see. Ah, uh, doesn't have control over admin, admin stuff. And that's just a weird thing you're going to run into when you do window managers in Windows, though. Because window manager can't interface with uh, the administration. Things that are elevated above it, which makes sense. It's kind of like how when you run like gparted as sudo and then it doesn't grab your your current theme. Like it goes full light theme and doesn't honor your dark theme that's set on the user. Okay. So if we go to tweaks, I want to say we did the, what was it? The context menu, right? Set classic right click menu, run tweak. I actually had a restore point set. I should have disabled restore point, but whatever. We'll let the restore point run. Okay, so now we have classic enabled. And if we come back into here, let's give it a little reboot and see what we get on restart. Now we did disable uh, some of the edge services. Edge is still installed on the machine, but it was actually it was actually impacting a lot of the startup. We should have a faster startup here because this is restarting, updating, and then uh, pulling back up the desktop. Yeah, the Nilesoft shell is a really good alternative as well. If you want like a more customized context menu using the same like WinUI 3 style theme, it's actually not a bad idea. Here we go. Now, does it launch our... Yeah, there's... There we go. Now, I think what we could do is start that like minimized. So then it just kind of sits in the prompt. I know that's like not ideal for many, but I actually don't mind it. Because that gives us uh, something where we can just pull up PowerShell at, at a moment's notice with it running in the background. So for me, that's actually not bad. Uh, we can actually just add a trigger. I want to say minimize would actually do it. So let's take this one. And then let's do a glaze WM. And I want to say if you go dash minimize. No, that's not working. What would be the trigger for that? Glaze WM. Hmm. I think it installed on local app data. Let's just go explore and let's pull up local app data. Did it pull it into here? Oh. Oh, I guess it didn't like that. Let's just CD over into app data. I think that gets me the Oh. Can it... I can't remember. No, I think in PowerShell, it's like EMV. That's user profile. Oh, wait. Okay, that's roaming. I think it is EMV local, maybe? Local app data. Yeah, that's what we want. So let's go explore. And we'll just grab the environment local app data directory. And glaze. Glaze window manager? Maybe. Yeah, so the percent sign app data and percent sign local app data, I believe works in the run command. Uh, however, if you're in PowerShell, you need to use and grab the variables through ENV. Just one of them Windows things. The more you know, I don't... I might be having a problem with reading. You know me and reading. Oof. Uh, I don't see it here. Let's go into roaming. So it didn't install it here. Where did Glaze get installed to? Huh. Program files, maybe. I don't think so. Yeah. No Glaze WM here. 
Let's go, uh, Thorium. I think we have history. Glaze. Where are you in Stalin? Well, let's read the documentation, shall we? We install it. Bam. Configuration. Configuration is in the dot glaze WM. But the executable for glaze WM would be. Wait. I think it shows it right here. Oh, okay. Local app data Microsoft win get packages by default. It's considered a portable package. That's why. Uh, it's just a tricky, tricky thing. So if you, I think this is where, I think you can use percent sign here. So you think you can go app data in Explorer? Yeah, you can. So then you go Microsoft and what was it? Microsoft Winget packages, Winget packages. Then you got Glaze and the, the executables right here. Very, very cool. So what I'm thinking here uh, to fix this, to like run without CMD, I wanted to give a better solution. Instead of doing it through a batch file like we were doing here, which I don't mind, you know, personally, because I always, anytime on Windows, I have the CLI open. But I know I am more of the exception than the rule. Most Windows users are like, what is this sorcery? You're using the CLI, uh, which I get. So if you go properties, you can actually run minimized apply. And I think that will get Glaze window manager working. Probably the best way to go. Let's, let's reboot and see what this looks like on startup. I do like the defaults though. Very, very cool. I really, really dig it. <laughs> you can do the reg edit ad. You put it in a current version run. It's true. <laughs> More like torturing yourself in Windows. I don't know. Uh, I really like the CLI. I, I, you can get a lot of stuff done pretty darn quick. Especially Windows 11 has been... I've definitely found myself more in the CLI in Windows 11 than any other Windows version. It, it feels like the user experience for Windows has gotten to the point where it's more convoluted. So like when you're looking for a specific setting, a lot of times you're drilling down, you're clicking five or six times to get to where you need to go. And then uh, you finally get there. Yeah, I think we pulled up uh, issues already on WinUtil, Yusuf. Now, did that work? It did work. Did it minimize into a CMD? Very clean, okay, cool. So that was the way to do it with the shortcut. I do like it. anything. Let's, let's take a look. Yeah, there's still 30. There's always going to be issues outstanding on, on the toolbox. Uh, it, it, a lot of them, well, let's just browse real fast just to see if there's anything going on here. Anything jumps out at me. This should be the latest. That's so strange. Anyhow, uh, let's keep going. Script there. Microswin returns. There's a lot of microwins popping up here, which I thought was kind of interesting, too. Ah, thanks for the prime there, Raz. Raise. Oh, all right. I do want to try Microwin again because I think some folks mentioned that they were having some issues with Microwin. We did do a lot of patches from the test, but we'll see how it goes. IS, thanks for the sub, man. Thanks for the prime. Much appreciated, guys. So no idea on which part Defender didn't like in the script have no idea because the script itself did not change this last PR that we we took in today I had I think there was one application change there was a slight change with micro win just some little bug fixes and then the other thing we had was I, I think there was some Winget install fixes Winget changed a little bit but that was it so there was not anything that could have been flagged from the changes the commit itself was small. That's why I was like, oh, well, let's just merge test and domain because I've only done a couple commits, which is kind of wild. Uh, let's look. You get the, the problem you're having with the get WM object is right here. And let's see. Yusuf added it 
did we already merge this in? The Wolves, thanks for the gifted tier one, man. Man, I really do like this glaze, though. I didn't think I would. But having, like, the offset from the Windows key and the Alt key, it really just jibes with me. Oh, you already put a PR in. Okay, let's try it, Yusuf. What do we got? Okay. That looks like a pretty basic change. Just one line change. Sw switching the CIM instance. Have you tested it? Let's try it. Um, I did. I should have deleted this test branch and done a new one. I hate grabbing. Hmm. <laughs> it does. Okay, you tested. Okay. Let's go ahead and approve this change. And we'll do a squash and merge into test. And then adding a few apps. I think I'm going to deny this one. A lot of these having like a, just a giant dump of apps into the toolbox not really something I want like explore patcher I know I don't want and those types of things what other was changed in here was it just applications JSON I do need to look through and see if there's a some people modify the XAML too this is actually the proper way you should do it but I don't know I, I don't really want to just take in a bunch of apps I mean they aren't necessarily bad apps they're just more obscure lock hunter Lock Hunter is a free tool to delete files blocked by something you don't know. That's kind of cool. Link shell extension. Yeah. Okay. So does the CIM instance work in PowerShell 5? I know WMI object works in 5, but if we switching it to CMI instance, does that work in 5? Now that we fixed it in 7, does that break the official 5? That's, that's another kind of gotcha. You can always test that too. So by default, I'm using, um, let's see, should go PowerShell and we're going to grab, I always mix them up. So this is PowerShell five. Let's do an IRM, Chris Titus dot. Oh, actually, uh, let's grab the test so we can test this out. We'll find out very, very quickly. Um, I'm hesitant to take that. I'm going to think about that a little bit longer. Let's go back to when you till we're going to come on over to test and under test, we'll go to the PSI PS one file, grab the raw IRM and IEX looks to be just fine. I didn't see any errors there. Looking back in PowerShell, don't see any errors here. Okay, cool. That, that worked as well. So yeah, the CIM instance is the correct way to do it. <laughs> yeah, Monk. Phoenix hounded me until I did it. And then I was like, oh, where's this been all my life? <laughs> I do like it. Uh, I do want to ask one thing, though. Glaze, WM, program, hotkeys. I want to add hotkeys for specific programs. Can we do that? So there's this. Key bindings. Let's go for a full list. Yeah, yeah. But if we want to launch an application, maybe we can do that. One thing we can do, uh, let's go here. It's all done in compound. Yeah, let's see. Well, actually, you know what? Instead of just doing it there, let's just, uh, do we have cursor? Yeah, we have cursor. I'm lazy. What can I say? I think we can do, is it all though? I think it's all Dell. Nah, control L, I think it's it. All right, uh, let's just ask how to launch, ah, how to change config.yaml in glaze wm to launch my browser as a hotkey. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Modify the hotkey and binding under key bindings, mod 4b. Oh, okay, well, that's easy. Just a simple execute ex command. We'll get it going. So, I, I honestly don't think I'll go with alt for the key binding. So let's go over here. And I'm actually just going to go normal terminal. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I got my Linux hat on. Uh, glaze. And key. Do we have any more key bindings? I think right here is what we do. 
Now, for the key bindings here, it says just do that, where I think the dash command is specifically issuing a command to glaze WM. So we don't need to do dash command for the binding. Instead, uh, we'll see. Well, that's weird. I'm doing two, two managers, two window managers has still got to reprogram the brain here. So it wants something like this, but instead of like Firefox, we'll do Thorium, let's say. And instead of B, or actually we're just gonna go Alt B. This, this might, might backfire. Uh, let's see, what is the executable though? Ah, Thorium.exe. So that is correct. So we have that, save and quit. And then we do reload. No, that. Snip and sketch. What's going on? Um, was it control? I just thought it was. No, no, no. I'm on Windows. Okay. There we go. Could not parse. Did not find expected key. Hmm. Interesting. So. Maybe. Binding, Alt-1, key, combination to trigger the key binding. But this command. Now, if we go focus, let's launch. I wonder if this is raw input or not. One way we can test this, let's just go glaze WM. That'll launch it, maybe? Yeah, there it goes. Cool. Okay. It's going to require me to fix that, which is fine. Just write that out and we'll relaunch glaze. Nice. We'll push this to workspace two. And this time around, I think we can just like, let's say we're here and let's open up a new one. So if you go for focus workspace one, okay, that doesn't work. So the command field is only for, hmm, it's interesting. Do we need the quotes? I don't. I think we do. I think the execute of it is incorrect. There has to be, let's just look at someone else's glaze configuration. Glaze WM config file rice. Cool. Give me your GitHub. The easiest way I think is just to steal someone else's config file and take a look. Probably shouldn't have picked someone from South Korea to do this, but you know, just one of those things. <laughs> all right. So all this is about the same. These are bar modifications, workspace modifications, key binds. Okay. Let's look when we get some custom key binds. I'm sure this guy has some custom key binds. Wow. That's interesting. Uh, okay. I'll get that. Let's take a look at that config too, Monk. Because this one does not look that much different. Let's uh, pull up our chat, right? Do I not have Chatterino on here? Hmm. Unfortunate. That's okay. We have it over here. What, we have a open workspace. Yeah, let's just go number five. So if we look at this. Oh, wow. This guy went crazy with it. You need to do execute app as the command, then you can do the binding below. Thank you, Casper. That's what it is. The Korean one had the exact. So like, I bet this one has it too. So if we look for exec, you can say command exec, and then it has the full version and what it what it's doing. So that's, that's cool. I like it. Also pay it close attention here. You have to escape out the backslash. So it's, double backslashes when you're doing this. That's the problem with our current config. Interesting, a little nuance. I mean, you're always gonna have that, but it should just be something like this then. Command, and then it's exec, and then we have the full path name. So let's say we wanted to bind Thorium. Uh, we'll grab this guy, copy and paste it now obviously that's not going to work because we have double quotes and this won't work because we're escaping 
So what this looks like is something, something along those lines. And that should be good as long as we add bindings. And the bindings look like it uses this type of format. Alt plus B probably should be fine. So this right here, we'll save it out. And then if we reload, all right, we have this. Let's close that. We'll go to a new workspace and then Alt-B, problem, because we don't have uh, the space in program files tossed it out. Okay, that makes sense. All right, so this right here, I think, I don't know about doing that. We might do like a single quote. Uh, I feel like that's wrong, but it might, might, it might take that. All right, we'll try it again. Three, and then B. Oh, nice. Okay. And we could also escape out the, the path, but using a single quote also worked. And honestly, we probably could have done just Thorium straight up. Oh, how did you get a lower input for keyboard in Vert Manager? I have a nasty input lag. It doesn't get solved with Proxmox drivers, which are used. So you have to install the Proxmox, or it's actually the Vert IO drivers. Actually, I think Fedora makes them, but uh, here, real real fast, I'll show Peter this. In your vert manager, you notice how I have two keyboard and mouses? You have the PS2 ones by default. You can't remove these. You add new ones, and you reference the vert IO mouse and vert IO keyboard, and that should get you going. Also, to note, for this to work, I believe you have to have channel spice right here as well. So with those two things, you should have almost no latency. I actually had someone comment on that before too about latency in their, their VM. But yeah, I, I don't have any latency. It's it's just as good. Man, that's cool. So probably the next thing, I think we need to add a couple more to make this even better. So we're gonna yank these two files and paste, paste, oops. Yeah. All right, so we have B. I think we're gonna do an X. And for that one, I wanna say we could do execute terminal for that one. And then the final one, I kinda wanna do execute terminal. Also like an alt E and also want, and I think what we can do instead of execute, well, yeah. So for Alt X, I think we can do just terminal. Let's see what this does. We just do terminal. Oh, what is Windows terminal? Please don't have some funky. Oh, it's going to be a weird one. It's going to be a weird one. Oh, oh, execute WT. That's right. Sorry. Thanks. Chat to the rescue. They're like, oh, Titus is about to go down on a rabbit hole. Better save him. <laughs> Uh, okay, execute WT would be fine. So WT, and then this one, we're gonna go execute. Uh, let's go explore, and then for this one, I kind of want to make a special hotkey for cursor. I think cursor is probably another one. What else do we use like all the time? Yeah, cursor probably is enough. Yeah, Chatterino, I kind of want to just leave over in like here. I feel like that's that's the way to go. Like leaving Chatterino here, this is where it's at. And we already bound it, uh, bound the the killing of the hotkey, uh, so we don't need that. So yeah, cursor is probably where we want to go next. What key? If I was a key, what would it be? Alt L maybe? No. We're gonna start running into we'll start running into key bindings for applications though. That's why I'm like, I kinda wanna pick something special for this. Alt W? Do we use Alt W? Probably not. I think Alt W. Yeah, you can do Control Alt, Control Shift too. Yeah, let's see if it, it runs into any hotkeys. I don't think it's gonna though. I, I don't, as soon as I say that, I'm like, ah, crap, it, it was. 
Uh, let's go file location. Let's find the entire. Now you could probably, you probably don't need to go all the way into this. And you could probably just do cursor exe, but I, I don't know. Something in me is like, nah, just reference the whole thing. You could also do like a percent sign local app data and then just grab that would be also sufficient. Let's show that. So we've already seen this method. So what we're going to do is grab that and let's just take that. Ah. No, undo. Oh, the keyboard gets overwritten on terminal. <laughs> that sucks. So in Windows Terminal, as soon as you do that, it's already copied. So then when you go to right click anywhere, it'll, it's kind of annoying. It's interesting, but annoying. Um, where was my cursor at? Did, did it wipe out my... Yeah, sweet. So now we can go percent local app data percent and then we'll escape out our backslashes real fast and insert single all right and then we just reload we have everything and then if we go alt w launches cursor nice and then we're like okay alt q over here uh let's launch uh Another terminal, kill that. Got our browser, but if we went on to open it again, feels pretty damn good. All right, sweet, glaze, done. So we've got glaze WM, we got the bindings. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of bloat there, Peter. Uh, I like it, I like it. Thank you guys for hounding me to try Bla glaze WM. Way better than Cormambi. I'll make a video. I'll make a main channel video specifically over Glaze WM because I will use this. That's actually very, very cool. Much more efficient, too. So we'll do that. Uh, I wonder, can I rename the tab? Yeah. Glaze WM. Like it. What's the emergency? Oh, man. It started the stream. It started off spicy. I don't know. I, I might have to beep out in the edit. So whenever I edit this stream, I was cursing up a storm with Microsoft. They they flagged my winutil.ps1 file, but I think they flagged it from the hash because as soon as I merged from the test branch to the main branch, it was fine. No longer flagging as a virus. Yeah, Cormambi is early. I'm not I'm not hating on it. I, I don't want to like if the Cormambi dev watches this, please. Uh, Keep doing you, man. I, I don't get there, you know? Like, you can take any of my programs from the early days, and they're just absolutely awful. So d don't take it like, oh, I'm never going to try this again. Uh, no, not that. Very tongue-in-cheek. So, you know, it's like me calling things the devil. Like Microsoft Windows Defender, which is is satanic. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's uh, that's it. But yeah, no, no hate, no hate. I I want to definitely just say out of the gate, yeah, I don't want to discourage any developers out there. I'm not a developer. I'm I'm very much just a hobbyist YouTuber. Don't take me too seriously. Like I said, a lot of people do. Like I've had very like some really talented professional developers get in and go, you know, you've used reflat factor wrong or those types of things probably a hundred percent right you know but a lot of times i'm just like let's let's do this i want to learn this and many of my streams is just more about the learning experience let's just break things have a good time and go for it snap is absolutely you know that's one thing that has aged very gracefully my ubuntu hate you remember when i when i made like a like i think it was like 2019 i actually privated the video it got almost a million views but i called ubuntu the devil and at the time it was pretty controversial and i kind of droned on back in those days when i first started youtube i had a tendency to just not be real succinct and be like okay here's here's the things you need to watch out here's the things ubuntu did and i kind of it was like a 17 minute long rambling video that ended up getting like a million views 
And I didn't like how I presented it because it was more uh, off the cuff and a little too aggressive, let's just say. Uh, but looking back on it, man, I still, the, the spirit of that video is still 100% on because I really was harping on Snap. And then after that, I made another video kind of as a follow up about Snaps, particularly. And I was like, this is terrible. It's a closed source store, it's going to have problems. And then uh, I didn't even make a video about the last month where they introduced a ton of like bad crypto wallets into the snap store that stole people's cryptocurrency. Uh, and there was no vetting process of the snap store. And since it's all closed behind canonicals firewall, basically, uh, yeah, it was, it was really, really bad. So, Hey, that aged like a fine wine. Me basically calling them devil. I should have probably capitalized on the viruses in the Snap Store and uh, made a video. But I was, I think I was right in the middle of moving and redoing everything here in the studio. And I was like, ah, I ain't got time to make a video. And I think Brody covered it pretty well and said everything that needed to be said. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that that's the thing. Is if someone beats me to it and they did a good job explaining it, I'm like, okay. Brody does have a tendency to ramble on a little bit. I wish he was a little more succinct, but that'll come with time. You know, give give Brody another couple of years. He's going to be jamming out videos and be more on point. And I, I would also say to Brody, I love him to death. But the number one rule of YouTube, there's only one rule that every single person needs to follow, including myself, and sometimes I don't. Show, don't tell. Show, don't tell is the best biggest thing you can do i still have problems with that but i always remind myself i have a giant giant note show don't tell <laughs> oh yeah yeah beaten with it with vento oh yeah oh vento man oh. oh the golden rule that's a golden rule 100 percent there's a lot of rules there's a lot of rules to youtube believe it or not i, I, I they're like you don't necessarily have to follow the rules but those rules are kind of, my rules are set there to make sure each video will do pretty well. Even the videos that bomb still do thousands upon thousands of views because I follow the rules. You know, and there are many. Uh, let me let me just ramble off some off the top of my head. Some of these I kind of make up right on the spot, but let's just go for it. Uh, here, let's, let's show, don't tell. Uh, oh, let's not use Windows for this. Uh, we we'll call this YouTube rules dot text. And do, let me see. Let's just go up a little bit. Number one. Oh, nope. Number one. Show, don't tell. Number two. Hmm. Number two rule of YouTube that you should never do. Never, ever, under any circumstance stance yo oh god you're gonna see my failed english here talk politics soon as you start talking politics and youtube you're dead you are dead you you immediately will get lumped in especially here in america you're gonna get lumped in with one half and you're gonna alienate 50 percent of your audience never ever talk politics number three eh, don't engage with trolls that's okay don't engage with trolls shadow ban is your friend shadow bans are great because guess what they won't even know you banned them and let's say they're like you're 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 holding everybody down you're like ah this youtuber is banning me they won't know and as a youtuber you can always come back and say I don't know. I'm not in charge of YouTube's rules and regulations and how they monitor the, the chat. I don't know what's going on. They're just doing something weird with the. <laughs> and honestly, that's actually a pretty legitimate statement. YouTube, YouTube's moderation system is all over the place. It's like the only thing that ever gets through is if you have like a sex bot and you want to throw in like a scantily clad uh, little shot. Uh, as your profile picture and then just say love this video subscribe uh please keep making them with like a squirt emoji or something or an eggplant emoji those always get through it's like uh youtube's algorithm is kind of weird on that one 
let's see. Uh, and number four. Oh, YouTube. YouTube rules. Oh, number four would probably be. Hmm. I'm trying to think. That's a, really those three are pretty good. Maybe no dead space, but I mean, it'd just be. That kind of goes with the show. Don't tell. Never get emotional. Now, I think the big thing here, most people that don't understand, is people have to feel something. The worst thing I can do is make a video and then you just go, meh. That's the worst thing. That's the thing that people, that's the thing people don't get about YouTube. It, it, like the whole, oh, I got canceled or whatever it is. No, no, honestly, <clears throat> that means you did something wrong and you probably had a whole bunch of stuff. But honestly, any publicity is good publicity as a YouTuber. Emotional is actually good. It, that means, hey, you're being genuine, but you got to make people feel something, you know? So emotion's good, but that's the thing. If it's really dry and people are just like, oh, yeah, I might have learned something there. Think of the tutorial on how to change your oil. You know? Let me close that. Uh, the tutorial on how to change your oil. Are you going to subscribe to that guy? No. You're going to figure out how to change your oil. And then you're probably never going to go back to that channel again. Same thing. Don't let the ego go to your head. That's going to happen regardless. But I I don't know if there's... Out of all the YouTubers I've met, I haven't really run into the egotistical YouTuber. Uh, I don't know if it's just like the tech sphere is different because we're not really that much of an entertainer. But most of the tech people, all the tech YouTubers I've met, dude, they're all super humble. And they're all like... I don't care. <laughs> you know, I'm nobody. People just watch me because sometimes I make a good video, sometimes not. So, yeah. I, I don't see that. I don't see the big ego. That's not actually a big problem. Everybody I've met, big YouTubers, really big YouTubers, all of them, they've all been really cool. Way bigger than me. And I, I've yet to run into a bad one. Best not, don't dox yourself. Well, this is a rule I break often. Don't dox yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I don't know if there's any other really big tools there. I guess the other thing I would say, you have to be genuine and also right behind be genuine. Enjoy your videos. There's something about being genuine and enjoying the videos you make that are super important. Even if it's like a super niche thing, you got to enjoy it. Like, I think back to where I have the most knowledge, where I have the most authority, and that is Windows Server. Windows Server, I could speak for hours upon hours, probably days, about all the different nuances of it. We could get into FISMO roles. We could get into domain replication errors. Uh, Active Directory and actually manually editing the Active Directory or doing like DC promos. There's a lot I could go over, but it would, I, it wouldn't be, I, I wouldn't be able to inject very much energy into it because I've done it for so many years, over 20 years now of Windows Server, starting with Windows Server 2000. And while the videos would be very informative, it would suck. And honestly, the views would be terrible because nobody cares about Windows Server anymore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's close to dead. But every business still uses it for Active Directory. Uh, but you got to enjoy them. You got to enjoy what you do. E even the more obscure stuff, if you enjoy it, though, it's, it's not so bad. And there's some stuff like when it comes to sponsors, I think that's the big thing I've never really found that figured out. Um... Yeah, who uses Windows Server? It's not fun in the home lab space, and it's not it's not a sexy thing when it comes to Windows Server, but if you need a job and you're in infrastructure, you absolutely 150,000% need to know Windows Server Active Directory. If you don't, you're not going to get hired. It's as simple as that. Hey, I know Linux Server. Too bad. You don't know Active Directory? You're not hired. You have to know Active Directory. I can't emphasize that enough. Every single business I've seen interfaces with Active Directory. 
you got to know like LDAP and understanding directories and just referencing them, adding users, all those things. And some people are like, hey, I, I use Azure and O365 and all that. Yeah, that's great and all, but you got to know on-prem Active Directory. It's still so, so prominent in the business community. And, and group policies, yeah. It, it's That's one thing that's like tons of influencers out there and people like, hey, I'm going to tell you how to get the IT job. All of them are like focused on security and programming. But as a guy that's hired literally hundreds of people in the space and has gone through and done a lot of things, Windows Server Active Directory is something you absolutely need to know. It's not sexy. It's not fun. And it sure as hell doesn't make a good YouTube video, but you got to learn it. It's so needed in business. Unix, sysadmin, I learned Active Directory. <laughs> <laughs> just for that and, and that's it just to interface with it it's not you don't have to learn all the nuances you, you don't have to worry about so much about like windows dns can be a little funky sometimes and windows dhcp servers I, i've seen them before I, I mean i don't know in today's hybrid world how much like dns and dhcps help uh, interface with uh that much but, you know, a lot of people can outsource those. But the thing that you can just everything that is needed in a Windows server is is Active Directory. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I would still learn that Active Directory, DNS, DHCP, those core that such core knowledge. Everyone needs to know it. It's one of those things. <sighs> yeah, actually, Network Chuck's right down the road to me. <laughs> one of these days, one of these days, I'll hit up Chuck. But yeah, it's a big thing. And actually working with Active Directory, it's not difficult. It's not like they need to know like how to manually edit Active Directory. And you're not going to be doing like moving FISMO rules or understanding a lot of the, the nuances of Windows Server. Honestly, there's going to be some old guy there like me take care of that. <laughs> there's going to be somebody that's done it like multiple times. You're not going to be just doing that offhand that's like such an apprentice move like there's nobody out there that's doing that for the first time from a google tutorial that's just it's not done it's such a it's such a rarity that you do it probably the biggest thing i could see doing is like elevating like a domain or a forest to you know changing that level from like server 2016 to like 2019 or whatever uh or i guess it's on 2022 now and elevating that so you can deploy group policy objects to like Windows 11. You know, that that's probably something that that'll appear, but yeah. <laughs> I taught people how to manage Windows Active Directory so I didn't have to. <laughs> I get it, man. <laughs> totally get that. Oh man, so great, so great. Yeah, I think this is probably the top seven rules. This, I don't think I even want to add to it. I think that's where we'll leave YouTube rules. I'd say don't beg for subs or complain about people not subscribing. Oh my God, that's a good one. That's a good one. Ah, oh, that's cringe. I don't know why people still do that. Like, think of it from a viewer standpoint. And here's the thing, I think why most big YouTubers are pretty humble. I think someone earlier mentioned like ego when it came to big YouTubers. And I, I've never met a big YouTuber with a big ego. And I think the reason being is big YouTubers understand nobody cares about you. It just how much value you can deliver to the viewer. You watching this, it's how much you're either entertained by me or how much knowledge I can teach you. That's the reason why you watch a stream or a video those are the reasons people don't care about you i know that sounds rude or mean but it's true it's about how much you can deliver and that's that's the key essence of it and uh as far as likes and subscribes and all that stuff that'll just come organically if you want to mention it you can mention it at the very end of the video and be like hey if you like this video hit the like button and subscribe if you like this type of content that's it whenever i watch like a new channel or someone coming up and they're like 57 percent of you aren't subscribed and you're like come on bro what are you doing 
Nobody gives a shit about how many percent of people are subscribed to you that are watching your videos. <laughs> it's just the worst. Or if they say like and subscribe, like right out of the gate, like in the first couple minutes, I'm like, why are they going to like and subscribe? They don't know you. That's like the first minute or two. And the average viewer isn't going to watch all your videos. Oh, hit that damn bell. I hate notification bell. Oh my God. Watch Mogo still does that crap. I'm like, how are you such a big company and all you still waste 30 percent, like 30 seconds of retention showing some stupid graph about how to enable the bell. That's doing you such a disservice and you're getting out of the algorithm because more people are clicking off during that stupid segment. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, and, and using sponsored block is probably the best way to do it. I love sponsored block. That's a good, good plug. Yeah, I think another big thing is a lot of a lot of YouTubers end up uh, doing too much with affiliate sales. Affiliate sales is a very powerful thing, and you can make a lot of money doing it. But it's one of those things. I my sweet spot with that, I I don't really do any ad spots or affiliate sales anymore because it's just too much of a headache. And what I like to do is dedicated videos. That way, like if I get sponsored by a video, I'll just plug in that video. And I'll just say in like the first 30 seconds to a minute, hey, this video is sponsored by whoever. And then if people want to watch the rest of the video, they can watch it. But if they don't, they can just not. And I think that's that's the perfect spot where you have just, hey, this is a sponsored piece of sponsored content or it's not. And I think that's that's what I like to do. And that's just for my sanity. I'm just not very good with plugs either. But yeah, that's me. I, but I've tried the affiliate sales. Back in the day, I used to try everything, like all the stuff. And I just, uh, that was my sweet spot. Just just for mental health and stuff. I can't do it. I don't know how like Linus and those guys do it. My hat's off to them that they can plug every video with like a beginning and end. I just, I can't. I just, I can't. It's just not, uh, not, not like from an ethical point of view or anything like that. It's just it drives me crazy the back and forth and the approval or you had to say this and since i don't script my videos it makes it way harder to do those types of things where all their stuff's scripted and they have writers that write all that stuff and then they tie into the sponsor and then some of them do a really good job of it i just i'm too much of a bullet point kind of guy i'm like all right i'm doing a video on this let me get the bullet points out there. And that's what I do. I don't really script. I just like, there we go. And then on the edit, I try and cut out all the filler words. So if there's any aspiring YouTuber out there, there's one thing I would recommend everyone do. Take a speech, public speaking class. That will be huge because your edits will become so much smaller because when you're going through the edits, you won't have any filler words. You'll speak much more clearly and deliberately. And yeah, there's just so much to it. Public speaking is probably the biggest thing I can say to someone. You take a good public speaker, you can just plop a camera in front of them and they're just off, off you go. Yeah. Anyhow, sorry, long YouTube brand. Um, and yeah, this was so good. We got glaze, we fixed the windows utility. This is so good. I love that. And yeah, interesting. Okay. LTT seems to improve since the drama. I agree with that. I think he's done a pretty good job with everything. I think having the CEO and all that, I think LTT's done great in that regard. The segues and the sponsors and all that. Yeah, it's annoying, but you sponsor block and it's fine. Uh, the font, I like to use Meslo nerd fonts. That's my favorite. Uh, Fire of Codes, uh, another nerd font I really like to use as well. Yeah, I think he's doing great. You know, I, I like Linus. And, and like I said, he, when I went up to LTX, he paid for like my hotel and I got to go in and chat with a whole bunch of YouTubers and all that stuff. I mean, he basically, I, I did it all on Linus's dime. I think that's pretty cool. And I was even, I, I don't know why he did it because I was actually pretty critical of him before that. If you guys remember the whole Linux when he did Linux, do as I say, I watched that video. I, I was, I was borderline a little bit mean in some areas to him. And that was super cool of him. Uh, 
to to be able to be like, yeah, come on out, have fun at LTX and put me up in a hotel room and that was cool. He didn't say I had to do anything. I didn't have to do any like walk on stage and do some kind of expose. He didn't say, hey, you have to be on the floor or even do a signing or anything. He's just like, hey, have fun. <laughs> and then he, he handed out like all his merch. He was like, here, have a screwdriver. Here's a bag. Here's, uh, I think I got a water bottle as well. It was kind of cool. Yeah. And looking back on that, like you got to remember, he was doing it since 20, which is super difficult thing to do. Most people don't realize look, YouTube is like my kids are, you know, in teenagers at this point and, you know, in 20, but a lot of teenagers, like they want to be YouTubers. And I'm like, no, I already told my kids, nah, you don't want to do that. You want to do something different because mental health wise, you don't know who you are at that age. And you're going to have a ton of people making fun of you saying mean things like it happens to everybody. I, I was watching like a YouTube chess channel and somebody was just making fun of this guy that was just doing a tutorial on chess and doing a fantastic job of it. And I was like, damn, that's kind of messed up. So that could really mess with someone's psyche. And the fact Linus is as level headed as he is at his age, being in social media for as long as he is, is kind of crazy, kind of surprising. So yeah. Yeah, just, just my thought on that. Don't try to please people. Just be yourself and people will grab it. Yeah, I think that's a, a big thing too, Peter. Is you got to gotta just do you. I mean, that's easy for me to say though because I'm 40. You know, I'm in my 40s. I am who I am at this point. And there's nothing that is going to change me. So for me, it was pretty easy. I, I Actually, when I started YouTube, I would have been, I would have been 37. So pretty late pretty late to the game in late 2018 yeah let's look at take a look at the the prs one more time before we go oh actually oops wrong hotkey um let's go control shift three it's kind of a weird key combination for me uh let's go github you should make a video on things which you don't said which you don't stand by anymore tech wise I don't know what that would be. What do you think on that, Peter? What have I said in the past that you don't think I agree with anymore? All right, we got invoke when you till GPU. This should be a proper fix to invoke when GPU. Yusuf made a fix to the wrong file. Oh, he might've done it directly to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, that's funny. Thank you for that. <laughs> He might have done it directly to win util and I didn't catch it. All right. Squash and merge that. Pull requests. File converter URL. Changed a lot of things. What do we got? So we need to fix this. I'm actually going to deny this, but I get what you're saying. Um, this is actually some a big problem. Let's go over to when you tell. And if we look here, let's come on over. Uh, let's look at the XAML files. So this was actually added and you guys are going to laugh, but I believe, let me see, where was it? This is actually all wrong. Oh wait, no, no, no. This was an input. Oh, no, 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 we're good. We're good. But I want to say actually input app was generated. Uh, let's try it. Let's do a compile just to make sure that I'm right here. But I want to say when in doubt, we'll just delete everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So anyways, I want to say this generates uh, a proper input app. So you don't actually need to change anything in an input app. And I want to make sure I need to, I need to make some documentation around this. Uh, oh, that looks good. I know I'm kind of going fast, but I'm looking specifically for people that hard coded crap into the, the XAML file. That's fine. Starship prompt already. I know, I know, I know I will. I will. Um, yeah, I think this is good. 
let's come on over to here and let's just do a compile. And what I'm looking for is if we look at input app now, you see how it fills all these in. It pulls it from the JSON file. Manually adding the XAML file is not needed. So all you have to do for a, a commit is, uh, let's come on over here. All you have to do is just do the input, uh, just the application JSON. So like this file right here, not needed. Just delete it. Don't need it. Yeah, commit. Don't need it. This file right here, not needed. Delete it. Commit. So then when we refresh, all you're changing is the application J JSON files. So this would be fine because everything with WinUtil PS1, the XAML files, everything's compiled now, which is, it, I know it's kind of confusing. Yeah, it, it, it's it's one of those things I do need to do better job on the documentation. So I don't fault you at all, Yusuf. I appreciate the, the fix here with this. So now I could take this and just apply and approve it just to show you. So we submit that, perfect. Oh, there's conflicts that need to happen here. Okay, well, let's resolve the conflicts. Oh, it's not gonna allow me because I hit delete. So I'll probably just close this one. Uh, it doesn't like it when you delete the, the win util. So whenever someone submits uh, a pulp PR with like win util and input app XAML file, it's, you know, I, I need to delete those out and there's no real good way to do that and then accept it because then I have no way of resolving the conflict unless I go into like CLI. At that point, it's like, whatever, I'll just do the change myself. So that's uh, that's the gist of it. And I need to make some better documentation so when people do uh, commit, they know, hey, it's just application JSON that you, you worry about. Oh, the, the status bar? Uh, yeah, I could probably do that. You know me, I'm kind of minimal on my status bar. I wonder. Oh, you can actually right click up here and reload config. That's cool. I like that. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I appreciate, like I said, I appreciate everybody that comes out and, and looks at and tries to contribute. And, uh, you know, a lot of times, a lot of the stuff, I remember when I first took this, this whole project, I, I was a noob in GitHub when I first created it. And I didn't understand like PRs and basic commits and proper versioning and controlling, hey, what kind of code comes in and out. So it was really weird when I first started, it was just a basic PS1 file that I had run as a sysadmin to fix up computers. That's how this whole thing started. And then people are like, I need a GUI or I don't like this decision you made. Can I have an option to disable that? And then slowly it kind of worked into what it was. But I've had some big like developers come in and, and really made massive changes. And when I was taking those changes, sometimes it'd take me a couple weeks to wrap my brain around the change because I'd never seen anything like it. Like the whole function in this compile with the subdirectories, that was developer derp that originally did that. And I was like, I, I couldn't figure it out for the longest time. And then I was like, I get it now. Everything's modular. So then if someone makes a change to this file and then you, you got a bad compile, it's not going to compile and you won't break everybody, <laughs> which is kind of cool. I love it. So it, it, I, I, I've grown immensely based on just the evolution of the project. It's great. Thank you so much, Kat. I appreciate it for the, the prime. Yeah. 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 I mean, the GUI is always are what, you know, I do want, if you want to appeal to the masses, you got to have a GUI. I still love just CLI scripts. They're just fast. They do your thing, but I get well, some people don't want to edit a CLI script. So I get it. Yeah. And I did Dell. Um, if you look on get, get, get ignore, we have, um, <clears throat> we have, let's see, what else do we have? We have when you till PS one there and all the log files are there. Uh, probably do the XAML files. Uh, the generation of the XAML files like app tweaks feature. I need to add those in to like generated XAML files right in here as well. That'd be actually a pretty good idea. So let's go into and do that and get pull. Huh? It's not liking that. What, what did I do here? Let's come on over. Um, GitHub desktop. What do we do? Discharge, 
Yeah. Since these are pulled anyways, it doesn't even matter. We'll just pull the origin. I was just doing it for an example. So now we can come back over to here and let's look at get ignore. And we have these executables and then ignore generated XAML files. And we'll add XAML input app, XAML input features, uh, features, why, why'd Copilot give me, don't do me dirty like that Copilot, XAML input tweaks, Im oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> Go home Copilot, you're drunk. <laughs> what are you doing? Okay, tweaks.xaml. <laughs> Gotta watch old Copilot, sometimes it throws stuff at you. <laughs> And that should be pretty good because all three of these files are generated. Now, input XAML is the structure of all those XAML. And sometimes we do make changes to that. So those aren't generated, but all these are. So we'll save that out. And oops, we come back over to here. Now you can see we have that. That we'll just commit and push that up. Oh, crap. I did it to the main branch. You see nothing. Ah, yeah, well, I already, I already pushed it. We're just going to do it on the test branch too. So we won't have a conflict. Uh, funny, whatever. Uh, we'll just update it on the test branch too. push that. All right. What do we have back over in here? Let's go back in our main branch. I think we need to resubmit the, the poll, the PR. Um, I'm going to leave this behind. Sorry. Um, I hate it when I don't take a PR, but sometimes it's just too much. And we're going to go to the test branch, create our PR here. So we're going to just do this. Uh, I forget. What do we, what do we do here? It was the last tweaks we made. I think we were just fixing a few issues with some typos. Uh, I don't even feel like titling this one. Let's just create the pull request. All right, now we're bringing this into main. Let's look at the files changed. Uh, we have the get ignore, which frankly, the main branch, I believe, should already have that, but whatever. You have that, applications JSON. We have a couple additions of like Firefox ESR tweaks. It's just some uh, IPv6 things. We have some typo errors here. Other functions. This is the Winget fixes. We have uh, this to fix the scope machine. Uh, errors for Winget. And fixes on the Winget install as well. You can see kind of the old method we were using. Um, chocolatey. We used to do chocolatey install Winget when things failed. The problem is... The one thing I have with Chocolatey is a lot of times packages and scripts aren't updated in a timely manner. In this instance, Winget is not. And sadly, it, uh, it, it, it bombed out. Now it's actually a different package called Winget-CLI. Uh, but we'll see how long that stays up to date. Good to know. A couple fixes to MicroWin. We have WinUtil, the fix between going from WMI object to CIM object. Uh, the upgrade commands, accepting source agreements, package agreements, and scope machine. We have MicroWin PS1, which the scope machine on this one might cause some errors on upgrading. I don't know 100% on that. We'll have to keep an eye on it. Uh, changing from DISM to mounting and unmounting to actually using the traditional uh, PowerShell commands of mount Windows image and dismount Windows image. I'm not 100% if that's available in Windows 10. I do know it is in Windows 11 though. So that's a little bit different way of doing the mount and dismount, but nothing nothing crazy there. Uh, input XAML. I mean, it doesn't really matter. It's all gonna get overwritten anyways. Let's approve. Oh, I can't approve my own PR. Yep, yep. Uh, at the very start of the day, Hex, it, it, it tripped it as malware. Yeah, we ended up tracking it down and it looks like the hash for windows util.ps1 somehow messed up things so i'm like okay that's a little odd but so be it 
Let's squash and merge, confirm. And we're gonna delete the branch. All right, now we're good. If we go back to Windows Util, we have a fresh, fresh Windows Util. Now we're gonna create a new test branch. We'll call this one test. 2024 and it is uh, March 28th and create new branch. So then new PRs that come in will go into that branch. It's important to delete the old branches because then you have all these weird offsets. So you don't want to merge the test branch over and over again. You want a new test branch after each PR. Frankly, I should be doing this almost every week, the two weeks, because doing more than like 10 commits in a PR, I don't really like to do too many. So that should do us there. Let's finish, uh, let the actions. We still have to fix the pester. Um, the testing and the pester ones on the main branch will actually fail out. You'll see it actually fail here, but that's okay. It's just one of those things I keep forgetting to update. Yeah, I mean, a new branch almost every week. It depends on how many commits I get. Sometimes I have a lot of really good PRs. Sometimes I don't have very many. So once I get to about, you know, five to 10 really good commits, and if there's a lot of lines changing, I'll freeze that branch and then I'll want to merge it. And I don't accept any PRs. Adding too many PRs into one branch can just be a huge mess. So for management purposes, it's really nice to be like, okay, I got five or six really good commits. That's a good feature set. I'm going to go ahead and merge that in the main after doing tests and then good. We probably should have tested this a little bit more, but I, they weren't very big changes, so I'm not really that worried about it. Uh, probably the last thing we changed, probably like CIM instance would be what we need to reference here. So what I like to do is go, okay, we changed it from WMI object to CIM, CIM instance. I'll like to grab the raw file here and then just go CIM instance. Okay, cool. So if this was still WMI object, the commit didn't go through. Sometimes the raw GitHub files takes like five minutes to update. But if you catch it right, right in a good cycle, it can update almost immediately. So it, it's something to watch out for when you're testing, uh, testing the branches. Uh, and we don't have a good uh, commit here. So let's just pull up admin prompt and we're just going to do an IRM paste this this is just the main branch with an IEX everything looks good here um, let's test probably the upgrade all I know that changed a little bit let's go upgrade all well that looks less than good it looks like errors specifically with my PowerShell prompt though that's a uh, terminal icons that's a, a module to make PowerShell look nice so not a big deal. Yeah, I read text scares people in PowerShell, but if you know how to read it, it's not that like that's a that's an error specific to me because I'm using a special PowerShell prompt that is trying to use terminal icons. Uh, that's part of it's actually an error regarding to my PowerShell profile. So that's what happened there. And that's good. What else do we have? I feel like everything else is pretty good. Oh, do we ever check the one tweak we wanted to actually check here? Let's just minimize this. Um, let's close out of that. The one tweak I wanted to check. Well, let's see. Cool. Yeah, I that the tweak for getting the classic right click menu. I wanted to just make sure that went through because we did. Uh, somebody mentioned that. And I was like, oh, yeah, let's test it out. So no more hey proceed with we just got the plain old regular context menu and then we can close our windows awesome sauce look at that beautiful uh might just switch this to test branch yeah uh, yeah oh well it's all good one thing i was just thinking about is like uh github desktop before i close out of this instance one thing i just make sure i do is pull in the new test branch and fetch it. That way, next time I open this up, I'm not like, oh, that worked. So, um, yeah, let's just restart. Good enough. <laughs> How about thermonuclear war? Yeah, I love, uh, I love the old war games, man. 
classic. It's such a classic. How do you get it done that you immediately go from workspaces of Windows back to another workspace with the keys and keyboards being captured by Windows? Uh, I changed the capture. It gets a little complex, Peter, because I changed the mod key for Win Linux. It's it's the Windows key or the super, super key, and that switches my workspaces. For Windows, it's the Alt key. So I do Alt 1, Alt 2, Alt 3, and that's my workspaces. In Linux, it's Super 1, Super 2, Super 3, and so on and so forth. And then I changed most of that. So I know my leader keys, basically, depending on where I'm in. And then I'm if I'm in Vim, the leader key is going to be Space instead of like Super or Alt. And I'm still training my brain around that. I don't know if it's perfect, but it does feel pretty good. So yeah. Add Glaze WM to Windows Util. Yeah, Mary, I think I might actually do like an install script with a rice. I'm going to do a full blown video on the main channel about uh, Glaze WM. And I think that's going to be pretty sweet. I just want to kind of make it more noob friendly because there's a couple things about the config creation I wanted to change. Like having default 20 gaps is just insane. Like that's crazy. And then uh, adding specific hotkeys, I think is another big one to, to kind of go over. But overall, really good stream today. We've got the WinUtil emergency taken care of. We've got Glaze WM pretty much buttoned up really nice. We did a bunch of PRs in Windows Utility actually evolving it. I really wanted to check MicroWin, but didn't get around to it. That's one thing we've been kind of accepting some PRs on. Man. Very solid day. The last stream on Tuesday felt like a bit of a train wreck. I think that one's going up tomorrow live. Uh, and then this stream will probably go up on like Sunday. Uh, and I'll edit it down. I have to bleep out so much in the beginning of this stream. I was cursing up a storm. <laughs> but, but fun, man. I appreciate everybody stopping by today. And... Uh, Going through all this, man, it was it was a little bit of a stressful start to the day when I start getting inundated with, hey, it's a virus, Defender's coming after me, but I still don't quite know what happened with that, which makes me a little worried that in the future it's going to get flagged again, depending on what's going on. Um, there's ways around that, I think. I do have some code signing specifically, and we could do some C Sharp. I really actually wanted to get into some win one shot C Sharp development. I think I, I'm gonna be doing that a bunch. Uh, getting into C Sharp, writing an actual executable file that the using just .NET libraries, there's nothing, nothing Microsoft can do about that. I know I can get around Defender 100% of the time and do all the system modifications I need to do without it tripping. Uh, but then again, it's closed source at that point. So, eh, we'll see. I, it's not as good as C. I, I've noticed a lot of the, the hipster programmers today, you know, the younger programmers that are really popular in social media, a lot of them talk a lot of crap about C. I was like, really? I don't know if they're... It seems like a lot of them are just Rust fanboys. I, I, I mean, Rust is pretty cool. I will say that. But uh, I don't know. I, I feel like C is like the granddaddy of all languages and everyone should learn it. Um, I know I'm still learning it. <laughs> so, I mean, I think, I, I think it's pretty cool. I think most of them have problems with C++. I think C++ is the one where they're like... That's made by a crazy person, which I can kind of get. Like, I know wrapping your mind around like pointers and some of that other stuff, it's it's beyond my knowledge. And I'm like, okay, I, I can kind of get that. But yeah, didn't, didn't there wasn't there like a news article about memory unsafe applications being like the White House didn't want them or something? I, I remember seeing it on my feed. I just didn't click on it. Yeah. So I was like, oh, okay. I mean, honestly, I don't mind. Like I said, learning all of it's just fun. I enjoy all programming languages, whether it's C, Rust. Uh, I will say Rust was super easy. Like I remember us doing like a late night, the Saturday night stream or something, and I pulled up Rust, and man, we were we were able to just be jamming away in no time flat. It was it was a very straightforward language. So I get why people love it, a hundred percent on that. But yeah, C has some really weird nuances. 
and we, we were messing around, especially C sharp. And we had some pro, uh, professional programmers pop in chat and they explained some things in C that we were doing when we were doing like JSON, uh, ingestion. And that was crazy. I was like, okay. <laughs> Machine. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. All right, y'all. Peace.